reach into the book of Jonah this morning. Very familiar story. I was going to preach this Thursday night. We ended up having a uh, prayer service before it was over with. And the Lord knew exactly when and where and how that this should be preached. And so this morning, it's no coincidence, I believe the Lord has laid it and pressed it on my heart to share what he has laid on my heart today. I've thought quite a bit about this particular subject over the last couple of months. I thought a lot about the story of Jonah, a lot about the people that I love and where they are and how many that are running from God, how heartbreaking that it is. When you see people with great ability and talent to bless the Lord, work for the Lord, Many times those very people don't see or feel like they have any abilities, but yet they do. God's blessed them, and yet they're running from the Lord. Jonah chapter 2, verse number 1. We're going to read verses 1 through verse number 10. This is after the fact that Jonah has been, uh, he has run from the Lord. He was supposed to be in Nineveh. Now he's in Tarshish, or he's running toward Tarshish. On board a ship, the men have thrown him overboard, and now he's been swallowed by a whale. Jonah chapter 2, verse 1. If you have it, say amen. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction. Plan to preach this the other day, and I read this again this morning, and that particular part just reached out and grabbed me. I want you to listen to what he said one more time. I cried by the reason of my affliction unto the Lord. He heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest. My voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about all thy billows, and thy waves are passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. Much like the prodigal son, I'm coming back. I'm looking back to where I should have been looking in the first place. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped around my head. Imagine what it would be like being inside of a fish's guts. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord, my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, to thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Now after all of that, look at verse 10. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon dry land. With the help of the Lord this morning, I'd like to preach on sometimes it takes a whale. Sometimes it takes a whale. Stretch your hand of the Lord this morning. Pray for the will of God. Father, this morning I love you, and I appreciate the word of God. I'm asking you this morning to speak to this congregation. Talk to us. Right out of the word of God, I'm asking you, Lord, to show us exactly what it is that you desire to say to each and every one of us, Lord, that we might be better when it's all over with. Challenge us, convict us. God, help us to get closer than we've ever been. 
And I pray you'll do that through the preaching of the Word of God, add the anointing that makes it all worthwhile. Bring those that need to pray to the altar this morning. God, that's the most precious part of this service. And everyone can say amen. Find three people this morning and tell them sometimes it just takes a whale. Sometimes it takes a whale. It's fair to say this morning that most people don't like correction. There are some people that I've ran into over the years that if you correct them, they get really defensive. And some of you sitting here this morning might be that way. But most people don't like correction, even though positive correction I have found can even save us a lot of grief. And in some cases, positive correction can even save a life. In all seriousness, it can. I'm going to tell you the truth. Whenever I taught my kids how to drive, I taught my daughter how to drive, and that was, that was, that was rough. When I taught my son, Devin, how to drive, I thought I was going to die in the process. It was one of the worst experiences I've ever had trying to teach somebody. I've taught a lot of people how to drive, and it was bar none one of the worst. I've had six years to 12 years taken off my life just teaching him how to I'm not kidding. I think I saw my life flash before me, and y'all think I'm joking. I'm serious. And uh, I feel bad for Justin because I don't know if I'm going to be ready. We might send him down to one of them places to teach you how to drive. I pulled up to a couple places, and I said, okay, now you got to stop right here, look both ways. And before I could even finish what I was saying, he was pulling right out in front of a car. Don't feel bad towards me, but your preacher punched the dash. I got so aggravated, scared to death all at one time. I said, what are you doing? You're going to kill us. And uh, every time I would try to correct him, bless his heart, he ain't here for for him to even defend himself, but I'm sure he'll give you his version of the story. But every time I'd go to correct him and I'd tell him the reason why you can't do this, you're not supposed to do that, you need to do this, it was always, well, I, the reason why I was doing the reason why, I don't want to hear the reason why, I just got to do the right thing, I don't care. I said, you can't pull out in front of people, you're going to kill us. If it wasn't that, it was running up on a curb up into the hedges and stuff, I'm telling you, it was, it was rough, folks, I'm not, I'm not joking at all. But he didn't really like the correction. But to be honest with you, I told him several times. I said, son, I said, I know you don't like it whenever I get on to you. You get home and tell his mom, dad, dad is so, will you teach me how to drive? Because dad is too hard. I said, dad is not too hard. Dad just wants to stay alive for the ride. You know what I'm saying? And, and whatever it takes to get your attention, you cannot pull out in front of somebody going 60 miles an hour. It just don't work well. And, you know, but he didn't really like the correction, but I kept telling him, I said, son, look here. I said, the truth is, I said, if I give you correction, you get aggravated me, I get aggravated with you. Later on, I don't have to get a phone call about whether or not you're dead because you pulled out in front of somebody and you wasn't paying attention. Because correction, will you agree with me, positive correction, can it can save you a lot of grief and it can even save your life if you're like me or like him, you know. And I found that in life that you, you try to reach out and you try to tell people something. You say, look, if you do this, this is going to happen. I've already been down that road. I'm going to try to save you a lot of trouble. I'm going to try to save you a lot of grief. There are some people out there, they are so stubborn, they're going to learn the hard way. It doesn't make no difference how many times they got to get bumped and bruised and everything. They are bound and determined. They are going to find out the hard way. You know, 
I really can't say a whole lot. When I was younger, I was that way in some ways myself. And so I just have to pray, God, save the knuckleheads and God, help those that are like I was that are hard-headed. You know what I'm saying? But everybody don't like correction. And if you try to tell somebody, and I have found that over the years that those that you sit back and you watch them, they're ruining their lives. Man, that's a hard thing to do. It's hard to sit back and feel hopeless and helpless like you can't do anything for those that are just totally messing their life up. Anybody got any family and you sit and watch them messing their life up and you're thinking to yourself the whole time, God, please intervene. Get their attention before it's too late. I've got some the same way and I'm saying, God, please help them before they make such a mess of their life that they got repercussions years and years down the road. They're people that they may get saved later in their life. God may help them in later years down the road. But yet because of the fact that they waited so long, they will suffer with all kinds of diseases and sicknesses and problems and divorces and everything else because of the fact that they prolong, they put off serving God for so long, giving God their everything. And the whole time they're giving us a heart attack just about it. And like Sister Tammy said, there's just about a nervous breakdown. I don't believe that's the case because of her daughter because of Savannah. They're trying to serve the Lord, do the right thing. But a lot of times people will put off doing the right thing and they just about give everybody that loves them a, a heart attack or a nervous breakdown because you think to yourself, please get your act together. You're giving mom and dad a heart attack. We're about to die over here watching you ruin in your life. Or you know, your aunt is having the most hardship trying to watch you messing your life up. You see people that are addicted to drugs and you see them go in jail, out of jail. You see them on all this stuff and you sit by and you're thinking, please just get it together. I'm praying for you. But I have found the truth is there's some people they are not going to listen to you. I don't care what you say, they ain't going to listen to you. And they're worse than one of them little dogs. I've joked around about this before. Y'all laughed at me, so I'll try to keep it serious. But it's worse than a dog. You go chasing him. Come here, here, Fido. Come here, come here, come here, Fido. And you, the more you chase him, the more he does what? The more he runs. And it drives me crazy. That's why I haven't had that many dogs in the last couple of years. Because whenever I tell him, come here, come here, come here, and I've done walk the city block, you're going to come here in a few minutes. We're going to put you in the cage, and you ain't going to get out. And he'll walk 10 steps and turn around and look at you, and walk 10 steps and turn around and look at you. And if you try to walk fast, what does he do? He takes off running. As a pastor, as a dad, as a family man, I've watched people that do the same thing and it drives me crazy. I try reach out, try to tell them God loves you. They don't want you. Come on, you try to tell them God loves you. They don't want to hear it. They want to change the subject. You try to tell them about the Lord. They don't want to hear it. If you want to talk to me about other things and great, they don't want to hear about God. I walk 10 steps and they turn around and look at me and tell, okay, take off running. That's a, exactly the way a lot of people are. I want to tell you, sometimes you just have to look and go, God, I don't know what else to do. I've done prayed all the prayers. I need to, I know I need to pray. I've even fast. Anybody here even fasted? Come on now. There's some of you like to eat and when you fast, that's a serious thing. It's got serious when you've done fasted some food. You know it's got serious. And some of you ain't going to miss a meal to save your life. And so whenever you say, God, I'm going without breakfast, and then you slept till 12 o'clock, you thought you really did something, right? Come on, somebody. You helping me? Amen. Am I right? But you know, whenever you start saying, I'm going to put some things aside. I'm not going to eat today. I'm not going to eat tomorrow. I'm going to do whatever it is. And so you've got serious, and you've done everything you knew to do. You've done prayed. You've given to God 15 times in the last 15 days and you then you just take it back but how much more is it going to take and what am I going to have to do I've said everything I thought I could say you got up one day and you thought oh you felt impressed of God to say something and so you went to him and you thought oh this is going to turn him around right here this will be the crossroad God laid something on my heart I'm going to tell him and sure enough they're going to turn around only to have them look at you like you have absolutely lost your mind or to challenge you 
can act like that you haven't even heard from God. Come on, anybody know what I'm, somebody here knows what I'm talking about. He comes, oh, God showed me this, or God showed me that, and then look at you like you are absolutely out of your mind and you miss God. And then have you walking away with your tail between your legs thinking, well, maybe I did miss God. I don't know. I thought I heard from God. But let me tell you some folks, sometimes you have got to take a few steps back and say, God, I know I realize that I cannot save them. I realize I cannot do this. If you want me to be a mouthpiece, I'll be a mouthpiece. If you want me to say something, I'll say something. If you want me to go somewhere, I'll go somewhere. But in the meantime, God, I'm wising up. I understand that there are some things that I cannot do within myself. There are people that I cannot change and it's only going to take the intervention of God himself. Does everybody understand that this morning? There are some situations that it's going to take the intervention of God himself. I don't care how much you talk. You might even make things worse. I don't care how much you try to do. You might make things even worse in the process. Sometimes you just got to pull over on the side of the road and say, God, I'm giving you this boatload of stuff. I've carried this backpack of pain. I've carried this burden. And I don't want to relieve myself of the burden for the souls. But this load is getting awful heavy for me to carry. I'm going to give it to you. You know why? Because God said, he said, cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. Do you know he is our burden bearer? He is the one that is capable of bearing what I cannot bear. When it gets to the place when we're like David and David said, when my heart is overwhelmed. How many remembers in the Psalms when David said, when my heart is overwhelmed. Do you know sometimes we get to that place. There are some of you here this morning you have been to the place where you're about to have a mental breakdown and we ain't joking come on you was to the place where you was shaking you was breathing hard and you felt like you was gonna just give out and die hey man there's some of you been there before but David said when my heart is overwhelmed lead me to the rock that is higher than I let me tell you church uh, here comes a time in your life uh, when you look at your circumstances and you survey the scene and you understand man this thing's bigger than I thought it was uh, they're more, they're worse off than I thought they was uh, it's bigger than I could ever imagine uh, what am I to do about this uh, I feel like one little man standing in a patch of peas trying to defend him in a patch of peas against a whole army of people you don't feel like running through a tree and leaping over a wall, you feel defeated. Somebody say, help me, God. But there comes a time when you gotta say, God, I know that one man in God can still win the victory. I know that if you'll step in, if you'll come down from that throne and stand here between me and that, if you'll stand between me and my family, everything's gonna be all right. Somebody say amen. Give God praise this morning. Mouth feel the Holy Ghost. Amen. I want you to know that is what we're beginning to see take place to some degree with Jonah when the Lord prepares a fish to swallow him in the middle of the ocean. You see, Jonah is a man who is running in the complete opposite direction of the Lord's will. God told Jonah, Jonah, go to Nineveh. Take the message over to the people of Nineveh and tell them they need to repent. Tell them they need to get right. But Jonah said, no, I'm going to get on board a ship. I'm headed to Tarsus. I'm going in the complete opposite direction of the Lord's will. Do you know some of you, you got family, there might even be somebody here today that is running in the complete opposite direction of what God's will is for their life or for your 
your life. Can somebody this morning say, God help your people? You see, this man that's running to Tarsus, he is already beginning to ruin and tarnish his reputation as a man of God. He is failing to deliver that which would spare a nation from the judgments of God. It was an important message that God wanted to get to Nineveh. Most of you may not know this, but when Jonah finally got right and Jonah finally got his heart right, he went to Nineveh and it is one of the greatest revivals recorded in the Bible. I think it was somewhere around 600,000 people that repented. The Bible tells us they put sackcloth and ashes on their cattle, on their animals. You had dogs and cows and everything else walking up and down the street. In my mind, I see everything. The Bible said they put sackcloth and ashes as a way of remorse between them and God. And yet this man carries the message from one of the greatest revivals, but he's running in the wrong direction. Honey, I got family this morning who are talented. I got those who could be a blessing to the church, and yet they're running in the wrong direction. Anybody else say amen? They know the word. They know the songs. They know the walk. They know the talk. They know the drill. They know what's expected. And yet they're running in the opposite direction. Somebody say, oh God, I want you to know this morning that this man named Jonah was called by God to deliver a great message of repentance in complete rebellion to the Lord's director. He chooses to do what he wants to do. Anybody know someone like that? I'm going to do what I want to do. This is my life. You're not going to tell me what to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. Amen. So he boards a ship going to Tarsus. Amen. Instead of going to Nineveh, the Bible shows us that a storm comes over the ship. And while Jonah's on that board, that ship, that storm comes in. And before long, the men that are on board, they begin to get the impression. The reason we're going through the storm, it is the anger and the wrath of God. And that's why we're going through what we're going through. Honey, don't think it's strange when you're on board the same ship and you're in an innocent man or an innocent woman and there's a storm on you and you recognize it as the judgment and the wrath of God. And you say to yourself, God, I don't understand. Did I do something wrong? You don't got to draw straws. The fact is there's someone on board that ship that's running the wrong direction and you just happen to be along for the ride. Somebody say, God help us this morning. But Jonah's on board that ship. They begin to draw straws. Before it's over with, Jonah says, I'm the man, I'm the reason. They throw Jonah overboard the ship. And guess what the Lord says? He said, I had a, I had a whale. The Bible said the Lord prepared a whale. Huh? I mean, y'all got to bear with me here. We're in Florida, folks. This is a popka. We're down to earth, just southern folks, okay? All right? Let's leave this professional stuff to the side for a minute. Y'all in bearing here with me? I mean, what in the world? I'm thinking to myself, Brother Benefield, that the Lord, before that Jonah ever got thrown overboard, God was knowing that was going to happen, and I don't know what that whale's name was. I don't know. Come here, come here, uh, come on over here. I got a hard head on board this ship. Come on over here, come on, uh, come on right over here. I don't know if he used sonar, I don't know what the Lord did, but something God said got that whale's attention. Amen, all God had to do was speak and he started puking. Let me tell you, all God had to do was start speaking and a whale started coming. God said, I prepared a whale. Oh God, that gets a hold of me this morning because I realize uh, that God said, okay, this is what it takes to get your attention. I would have liked to have got your attention in another way, but you're bound and determined you're going to Tarsus. So guess what, oh brother Jonah, amen, sometimes it takes a whale. Sometimes it takes something much bigger than you. Sometimes it takes something that'll be painful to you and those around you, but sometimes God has to do big things to get people's big attitude under subjection. 
how is God going to get his attention? Well, let me tell you, God prepares that well. Here he comes. Jonah's sinking. Can you see a man sinking deep, deep, deep down into the water? All of a sudden, here comes a big old whale. Swallows him up. I mean, what a strange story. But God sometimes uses the strangest things to get people's attention. And some of us are so out in middle of left field somewhere that whenever it does come you're sitting over to the corner biting your nails you've done been praying for the last five years that God would save their rascally hide and now you're over to the side oh God oh God oh what in the world oh my poor little baby what is going to happen to her what is going to happen to him let me tell you something God is going to make sure everything works out amen in some way or another but God has been hearing your prayers and God said I ordered a whale come on now I have a whale prepared and if that's what it takes that's what I'm going to do that's the reason why some go to jail that's the reason and why some stand in divorce court because God said I had to send a whale to get his attention that's the reason why some are paying child support because God said it took a whale some are going to drug rehab because sometimes it takes a whale and I tell you this morning God forbid that it ever get that far but if you're willing to see him get saved Sister West said it best this morning when she said it'll be a whole lot better all this stuff they go through then they can still He'll go to heaven. For the Bible said in one place, said if a man looked upon a woman in lust, he's committed adultery in his heart already. You know the verse, right? And God said he would be better to just pluck his eye out than to go to heaven or to go to hell with both eyes seeing than to make it to heaven. Amen, with just one eye. He said you'd be better to go to heaven with just one eyeball than to, come on now, than to go to hell with both eyes seeing. That is because God understands that your salvation is paramount. Your relationship with God in a right relationship is paramount. It's more important than what you like. It's more important than what you don't like. It's more important than a few days without electricity because your electric got turned off. It's more important than being at home and not being able to go anywhere because you ain't got gas. It's more important than the fact that you got to struggle month to month to month. It's better because God said, I'm going to come on, clamp that vice down and I'm going to keep clamping it down until that whale gets to the point that he's got that boy in inside till he says I've had enough I don't know I may get ahead of myself here but when I read this part this morning man it reached out and grabbed a hold of me sometimes it takes a whale right listen to what Jonah said in verse number 2 he said and I cried by the reason of my affliction God understands this morning that sometimes it's got to get dark. It's got to get painful. And sometimes God understands that it's going to take that before a man or a woman will cry out because of the reason of their affliction. Oh yeah, they were doing good whenever they, things were flying high and they were living in sin. Snort a line here, do a pill there, smoke a little weed here and there, had money. After a little while, started dealing a little bit here and there. Oh, I got my, I'm still keeping my, my drugs coming in. Nobody, I got it under wraps. Nobody knows about it. I get me a little high, helps me work better. I've got a good job. Let me tell you what God does. Sometimes God allows a whale to come by. And the next thing you know, that good job they had, ain't got it no more. Next thing you know, that good car they had, amen, either it quits running or they don't got it no more. And they'll call up mommy and daddy. Mommy, I need you to bail me out. Would you co-sign for me? 
Now, there are some instances where God may deal with your heart, but let me tell you, in a lot of times, what God tries to show you is that if you keep intervening and if you keep stepping in and you keep prying open the mouth of the whale and you keep bringing, come on, let me tell you, God doesn't want mommy and daddy to run down to the belly of the whale, pry the whale's jaws open and slide a couch inside of there. Come on, slide a lamp inside there. Here's a curry coffee maker while you're in there. Make yourself comfortable. Mommy and daddy's gonna make it easy on you. Let me tell you some folks, I know it may sound crazy and comical, let me tell you something that's exactly the way it is for a lot of folks sometimes mommy and daddy has to say mommy loves you daddy loves you grandma loves you but I'm not going to keep supplying the means for you to run from God I feel the Holy Ghost let me tell you this morning you cannot find yourself in a position where you are aiding somebody to keep going down the wrong path well, I sure would like to see them get delivered of alcohol. And then they come to you. Mom, I got the shakes. Can you go down and buy me some whiskey? Well, I sure don't want to see my baby shaking like that. First of all, if you're a saint of God, I don't care what the situation is. You've got no business buying somebody else alcohol, whether you drink it or you don't. Maybe I'm too old school for some folks. I'm going to tell you something. I still believe in purity and right living. I might not play the lottery and I ain't going to buy a ticket for you neither. I love you. God bless you. Go play it yourself. Well, I lost some of you right there, didn't I? Well, pastor, I, oh, I better get off that. Anyhow, let me tell you something. I love you and I want to see God help you and I want to see God help our families. But just like it was just a few weeks or whatever services ago, as I was walking right across this platform and the Spirit of God laid it in my heart, they're going to have to hit the absolute bottom before they'll ever come back up and understand the need for me. Because I walk, I breathe, I sleep, and I get up in the morning burdened. There are people that I love that I want to see so saved so bad that there ain't but one other person that even knows some of what I go through. The nights that I've laid in the bed and cried going to sleep, just me and her and telling her how burdened I was for somebody. How many times I've laid in the bed and I looked at her and I said, I wish they knew how bad they're hurting me. I wish they knew how bad it is and how I feel. I know, you see, my wife's already been down that road. What do you mean, Brother Myers? Yeah, because she was married to somebody who didn't want to serve God, who was running from God. But I want you to know I am living, breathing proof that if you stay faithful, it is possible for God to turn things around Somebody say, God help them. God help them this morning. Is anybody else besides me? You got somebody. You say, God, I don't want to see a whale come. I don't want to see them go through that. But if that's what it takes, I'm ready to see them get right. Somebody else feel the same way this morning. My Lord, this man by the name of Jonah, he begins to tell these men about the fact that it's him. He's guilty. They throw him overboard. Jonah gets swallowed up by a whale. We hear the very descriptive process by which Jonah begins to describe his experience. He said, weeds are wrapped around my head. Well, I reckon so. You're in the guts of a fish in the ocean. There are some fish I don't even like to smell, let alone be inside of one. Reckon how many other guts and things was in there? It's unpleasant. And then you sit by and feel bad for them because they're so unpleasant. They stink. But that's what happens whenever people ain't where they need to be. Do I need to give a salvation 101 here? Some of you need to come off of your high horse. That harsh spirit and attitude. Since when have you got to the place where you expect sinners to act like saints? They're going to do stuff they shouldn't do. They're not right with God. 
And how dare us sit back and expect sinners to act like there's something else than that. But when you begin to understand and you can have compassion... Do you remember what I preached here a while back about the hand that keeps on reaching? I want to tell you something, folks. There are many of you that had a past too. And there are many of you need to reflect back on where you used to be because some of you have done forgot. You get blown out of proportion because they can't seem to always keep their bills paid. And some of you had a day in your life when you had foreclosures, car repossessions, and everything else. And how dare you sit there with your high horse and point a finger. My Lord, I don't approve of it. I don't agree with it. It bothers me too. But when they get saved, then you can get upset. If they've been saved a few years, they're still doing that. But I'm going to tell you something. When you start having compassion and your heart bleeds over it, you understand they smell unpleasant. They're doing unpleasant things that may grieve you. Find out and you hear, well, they did this or they did that or they said this or they got engaged in that conversation. It still hurts. But as a child of God, you have to find within yourself, I have to put my agenda to the side for a little while while I focus in on that soul. Because if God gets a hold of that soul, if God gets a hold, I don't even have to worry about all this other stuff. Because God will take care of that one step at a time. I told my family yesterday, some of y'all are going to completely think I've lost my mind here. But I talked to some family yesterday going through it. They're going through the sifting, the shaking, a whale's come along. Well, I know we need to get in church. I said, wait a minute. I said, let me tell you something. I said, the longer I pastor, I have learned and I've discovered something about the church. I said, It's going to sound crazy for me to say this. I said, because I don't advocate you stay out of the house of God, okay? I said, but you can make church attendance and church an idol in itself. And you get the mentality, if I go to church, everything's going to be fixed. Are y'all still with me? You don't think I'm crazy yet? I said, we have got to the place... In a lot of our churches where that we've made it sound like church attendance equals salvation. Church attendance equals victory. Let me tell you something, folks. I will be one of the first ones to tell you. I believe in being faithful and not forsaking the assembling of yourself in the house of God. I am one of the first ones to tell you that. I am a big proponent of faithfulness to the church. But we have got to stop feeding people to think that going to church in itself is going to fix their marriage. Going to church in itself is going to fix their pain and their sorrow. I said, stop for a minute and listen to me. I said, it's not church per se that you need. I said, you need a right relationship with Christ. And I said, I don't care if you go down to First Baptist on refrigerator holler. I don't care. Please start somewhere. Please make the first step somehow. Get in a place where you can be fed. I said, but church attendance is a product of a right relationship with God. Because when you go to church, you go because you have a relationship and you want to get deeper and you want to be around the saints and you want to be around the fellowship of the people of God. I said, but the truth is what you need is a Monday through Sunday relationship. I said, you've got to follow through with what God's trying to do in your life. I said, you can't just go to church and think, whoop, that's it. I mean, everything's going to be fine. It's all fixed. I came to church. I sat on a pew. I tell you, it been a few times I pastored and preached, and I thought for sure the devil was sitting on one of them pews. It been a few times I preached, I felt like he was standing up there with me. But he he left the devil. And I've seen a lot of folks come to church and leave a devil. What are you telling me, Pastor Myers? I'm telling you that sometimes God has to come along and send a whale-sized thing to get your attention and wake you up and tell you, look, religion is not where it's at. 
another boyfriend, another girlfriend, another relationship, another one night stand, another pill from a bottle, another sip from a bottle. That's no, that is not where it's at. Folks, can I point you in one direction this morning? It is Christ and Christ alone. You need to go to him. You need to follow him. You need to seek after him. You need to seek to know him. You might say, well, my pastor's brother Joe Myers. Well, bless your heart. That's wonderful. If you talk to Sister Myers, you, you probably will get a high five or some knuckles or something, you know? And the Lord might look at you and say, that's great. That's my son. That's one of my preachers. But you have yet to fall in love with me. I'm going to tell you, folks, that's why many of our family members sat on pews for years and never really had it right. That's why some of our church family could sing and never really had it right. That's why some of them sit in a church service and the Holy Ghost falling all around them and them leave and still never have it right. It is because they got consumed with church events, church programs. I was raised this way. I was taught this way. I was told this way and all of this kind of stuff. And then when we start telling people that are backslid, you need to get right with God. The first thing they start thinking. Church attendance. And I got to stop chewing bubble gum. Stop using chapstick. And I got to, I got to, I got to, I got to. Somebody helping me Preach. I told somebody yesterday, I said, stop. I said, the Bible said, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I said, hey, you know, in all fun and everything, stop chewing hubba bubba. Amen, maybe that might help you in your sanctification. But honey, get right with God and God will choose. He'll show you what to do. He'll lead you down the path of righteousness. You need a relationship with God more than you need a better dress standard, more than you need a new mailing address. You need a right relationship with God. Oh, I feel passionate about this because I'm sick of seeing people get religion and not a relationship. If you're with me, somebody say amen. I'm tired of it. Somebody say, God help these people that are lost. I'm going to tell you this morning. One minute, this man Jonah's on his way to Tarsus. The next thing you know, God has got him swallowed up by a whale. All of this so God could reroute him back to Nineveh. Imagine a map. Nineveh's over here. Tarsus is over here. And Jonah's on a ship right here. God takes this whale, swallows him, and takes him back this way. Are you following what I'm saying? God said, well, Jonah, it is not my will for you to be over there. I got people over here that got a message they need to hear. And you're over here. And I'm going to do whatever I got to do to get you back where you're supposed to be. And you wonder why we go through and why people go through stuff. And you ain't got to be lost for God to send a whale. You could get lukewarm in your heart and going through the motions, coming to church, and you're as dead and dry as a saltine cracker that's expired and on its last leg, falling apart and crumbles. Drier than drier than dry. And God said, if I have to send a whale-sized thing to get your attention, to get you back down praying, ain't it a shame that God has to send junk so that we'll start praying again? I didn't hear Jonah praying out to God until a whale came by. And then Jonah said, because of my affliction, I'm crying. I hate to have to send a whale, son. But it's a whole lot better. And you going over there, losing out with me, and 600,000 people not hearing the word I gave you. Somebody agree with me this morning. God is a very serious. God, He's very serious about the salvation. If He wasn't serious, 
he wouldn't have hung on that cross. And the blood wouldn't have been shed if he was not serious. I'll tell you, this man named Jonah, God took a whale. And that whale became Jonah's transportation to transport Jonah back to where he should be. So don't be surprised if they go through an upheaval or some junk and you're thinking, oh, my little Susie, my little Julie, whoever. Ooh. Oh, bless their little heart. Mama, dad, grandma, grandpa, don't you get all stirred up and worried because God knows what he's going to have to do to take that situation to transport them back to where they should be. And when they call you on the phone and they say, Mama, I lost my job. Or Mama, he kicked me out. Mama, he don't want me no more. He says, that's all right, baby. Mama will take you. Huh? Don't you get off the phone, have to bawl your eyes out, worry to death. And I'm going to tell you something. It's just a part. It's my opinion. You take it for what it's worth. But I believe it's a part of God's plan. Because if God has to send something to transport them back, he'll do it. Say amen, somebody. Amen. The Lord has to. He'll use your tragedy and hardship to get you right back where you should have been in the first place. That's the reason why we've had family that have had to spend a few years in a six by eight cell just to wake them up and get their attention. They say, look, I don't want to go back there. I don't want to be there again. I got one working for me right now who said, I've done been there and I don't want to go back there again. We got saints of God sitting here in this service that have been down the road of fornication, down the road of adultery, down the road of addiction, down the road of a lot of different sins. And some of you are saying, I don't want to go down that road again. Are y'all helping me out? So, nod your head. Yes, that's me. I was there. You said, Pastor, you're right. I did it. I got so drunk out of my mind, I couldn't even hardly walk. But when it was all over with, and I had to make apologies after it was over with because I did things I should have never done, looking back, I don't ever want to go down that road again. Come on, church, help me out here. I don't ever want to go down that road again, Pastor. I want to share a few things with you before I close. It's all right if I slow down and preach this part out to you. This whale that the Lord used to swallow Jonah became God's way of getting Jonah's attention. It's pretty obvious. But verse 1, Jonah prayed unto the Lord and his God of the fish's belly. And he said, by, I cried by the reason of my affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me and out of the belly of hell cried I. And thou heardest me. God used that to get his attention. Because what happens is we or they are going about their business. And they're so busy. They haven't thought about God. They don't really think about what they should be doing. They're bent on one direction. They have certain goals in their life, and most of those goals have to do with self. But God loves them and loves you enough that He will send a whale-sized thing so that He can get your attention. I've had people before that have told me, Please stop praying for me. What do you mean? You're making my life miserable. And I've had to look them right in the face and say, I'd rather see you miserable here if it leads to you getting saved than to see you burn in hell for the rest of eternity. Oh, I love them, don't you? And I, I'm, I feel like the Lord when he said, he's not willing that any should perish, but that what that all should come to repentance. Somebody help me preach this morning. One of the things that I saw when I looked at this is that God allowed this for Jonah to become a mental and a spiritual time out. Stop everything that's going on so that just like that, God said, I'm stopping everything in its tracks. 
So if you lose your house, you lose your car, everything's falling apart, God said, I'm stopping everything in its track because I'm going to get your attention one way or the other. Become a mental and a spiritual time to get his attention. Not only that, but it also become a lonely place away from everything and everybody. Listen to me very closely. Loneliness can get your attention. Jonah is in a dark place. It's just him and a fish that he can't talk to. All by himself. God sometimes has to separate you from the people you love, the people you run with, everything else to get you all by yourself so you can get your act together. Because when you're around him and her and them, everybody's telling you, oh, you should do this. Oh, you should do that. I think this. I think that. God said, no, I'm sending a whale, and it's going to be lonely for a while. But if you will wise up, you'll find that in that lonely place, if you'll just call out to me, I'll be there. Because it was just Jonah and a whale, but in all truth, God was just a prayer away. God said, I'm right here close by, Jonah, and all you got to do is stop, slow down, get tired of where you're at, get tired of being lonely and say, God, help me. You see, some folks this morning are just one little simple short prayer away from getting the deliverance and the help they need. Just simply, I've preached this for years, I used to say when I was evangelizing, if you can still say three words, Lord, help me, you ain't got to pray fancy. You ain't got to know big swelling words. You don't have to have a big vocabulary. You just simply say, Lord, help me. It was a place of loneliness. And the Spirit of God showed me it was God's means of mercy. Verse number 8, the Bible said, They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. This is Jonah talking. Now Jonah's coming to his self. What lying vanities? To believe the lie that you can run from God and you're going to have peace? He says, those that, that they, they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Let me, let me preach this out for just a moment if I can. That's, that's the kind of people that keep telling themselves, well, if we just move, it'll be better. We just need to move. If we move, it'll all be better. If we get a better house, all this will be better. If I get another wife, if I could just get me another handsome husband, hmm? All this will be better. I just need, I need some change. I need, yeah, you need change, all right. You need to change your heart. You need to change your dirty ways. That's what you need. You need to take off the garments of unrighteousness and put on the garments of righteousness. I don't mean physical either. I'm talking about emotional and spiritual. And this is God's means of mercy. But, but Jonah says, they that observe these lying vanities, they forsake their own mercy. So when you start thinking that somehow you can run from God, You can go to Tarsus and God's going to be like, oh, well, see you later, Jonah. Take care. Have a good time. Write me when you get there. Send a postcard. It ain't nothing like that. God sees and God knows what you're doing. He sees you running. And God is not going to sit idly by and let you mess up your life while you just do all that. He ain't going to do it. And if you think for one minute that, oh, if I just go to Tarsus, I can get away from God. You got family this morning. They think just because they don't come to church with you. They're going to get away from God. I'm going to tell you something about mama, grandma, pastor's prayers, and others' prayers. Those prayers go farther than these walls right here. And those prayers will be out there like one of these WWF wrestlers whenever they give you the hook snag line. Just like that. Yoke you clean across the neck and bring you right back where you should be. You're running around. Woo, I'm having myself a time. And all of a sudden, God just sticks his arm out like that. Woo. God said, oh, wait just a minute. I had enough of all that running around stuff. It's time for you to get your act together. Come back to me. That's where some of you are. And that's when you start thinking, well, I just changed some stuff up. I changed my schedule at work and everything will be better. 
It's going to take so much more than that. It's going to take a right relationship with God. And if you keep telling yourself that you can change things and everything will be better, you're just lying to yourself and you're causing yourself to lose out on the mercy that God's already provided for you. Somebody say amen. I'm right, I'm right here almost done. There are two ways that this message applies to us. It's either directly to us or it's to those Jonas that we all know. So you're here this morning and either this message directly applies to you because you become weak, lukewarm, backslid, any of the above, or this message applies to you because of somebody that you know. One way or the other. How many altar services have you let go by when you got family that's lost and they're not where they need to be and they're not serving God? How many services have gone by? How many altar calls have gone by that you just, you just, you just, you didn't pray? You just let it slip you right on by. Why? You get so frustrated because it's a whale-sized problem and you just throw up your hands and you say, you know what, I can't deal with this anymore. I can't take it anymore. I don't know what I'm going to just, just forget it. Forget it. I want to say this, and I don't know why I feel like saying this, but I just feel very impressed. I've shared with you before about Joseph, the one with the coat of many colors, and how his brothers tried to kill him and how they mocked him and laughed because he said that God had given him a vision, that God was going to do this great thing, and he was going to make him a leader and all this. And you know, several years later, I don't know how many years passed between that and the time that he wound up in jail. But you you know, John, I mean, uh, uh, Joseph wound up in prison and historically they say it was somewhere around 15 years that he spent in prison so you calculate 15 years plus whatever time passed i don't know exactly from the time that his brothers threw him in a in a hole and left him for dead and all that time up to that point when he got put in jail and he had that to the 15 years and god says i'm going to do this great thing in your life what if, what if somewhere between the pit and the palace what if Joseph says, I'm done. I'm tired of waiting on this. I can't take it anymore. Somewhere along the line, you've got to get a grip and hold of yourself and you've got to say, God has never failed me and His plan is perfect. God's persistent, and He's going to reach. It's like I preached last week. If you missed it, you need to go back and listen. He's continually reaching. He's continually trying. Sister Tracy, if you could come play the piano for me this morning, I want everyone to stand to their feet as we close. As you stand to your feet this morning, I want you to take for a moment here I want you to stop and I want you to think about the fact that there have been some things that have gone on in the lives of people that are lost, that we love, that have been pretty big things. Hindering, interfering, disruptive things that sometimes have you up at night, worried throughout the day, I want to tell you it was no coincidence because somewhere between Nineveh and Tarshish maybe it was you or maybe it was someone you love and God said you know what I tried to get your attention this way and that didn't work I tried to get your attention over here that didn't work so if you have to have a whale size circumstance or situation or event in your life to get you to come to your senses I, God doesn't want to see you have to go through pain and suffering but that's what it takes God will do what he has to to get your attention because your soul is so much more important than your fleshly feelings and desires I want to give you an opportunity right now 
to make a bold statement before the Lord that says, I am willing to step over my fleshly pride and step out of an aisle, come down the altar and pray and kneel before the Lord and say, I'm ready, Lord. Will you do like Jonah and you say, I cried by the reason of my affliction. Things got so bad that I felt like if I didn't cry out to God that it was only going to get worse. Well, you can ride that whale all the way to the bottom of the ocean or you can get so tired of where you're at that you finally say, you know what, Brother Myers, I can't take this anymore. I've got to have an out. I've got to have some help. Well, I'll advise you to learn some, learn something from old Jonah. Jonah finally got tired of that place. He said it was like the belly of hell. Is that where some of you are? Is that where some of your family are? Has every head is bowed and eyes closed? I'm going to give you an opportunity right now. Come on to the altar. Don't hesitate. Don't wait. Just come to the altar right now. Some of you got family right now that's in jail. Some of you got family right now that's headed to court. Some of you got family that's headed to the courthouse. Some is going through marriage problems on the verge of a divorce. I don't know about you, but I'd much rather see them get saved, get right with God before they end like that before they wind up like that are you going to come and pray this morning find yourself a place right now and get in the altar I'll tell you the most important part of this entire service is this right here I said oh no pastor said most churches today it's the entertainment it's the worship it's the singing it's this and that no the most important part of this service is this right here this opportunity right here To kneel down and talk to the God himself. To be able to kneel down and say, God, I don't want to see them go through this stuff. But Lord, if that's what it takes. There are some of you parents that would be the first to say, no, Brother Myers, if they did something, I don't want them to get caught. I don't want to see them have to go. I don't want to go visit them down at the juvenile detention center, Brother Myers. Well, let me tell you something, Mom and Daddy. It might be the best thing that ever happened to them to get their attention. It might be the best thing for them to get caught. Oh, I don't want to see them get caught. I don't want to find out what they've been doing. I don't even want to know what they've been doing. Well, honey, I hate to tell you this, but that might be the very thing that gets their attention for them to slam on the brakes of their life and say, I've got to make some changes in my life. And the first one is to reach out to God. Come on. Saints of God, if you ain't praying, find somebody this morning. Help them pray. Lamb of God, this morning, we're thankful. That your mercy is everlasting. We're thankful this morning that your grace is there for not only us, but our families. Lord, we put them in your hands. God, we understand that without you, we are absolutely.